Hello, nerds. We're talking Solo, a Star Wars story. We're going to spoil it, so if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert. But if you've seen the Holy Trilogy, then I feel like you know what happens. But let's hit an intro. Quiet on the set. Rolling. Hi, I am Bitsy Tellick. Hey, I'm Hale Appleman. I'm Walter Kane. I'm Rene Auvergenois. Odo on Deep Space Nine. Michael Dorn, Lieutenant Commander Worf, Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, come and see me and hear me and talk to me and listen to me and talk about myself. Hey man, this is Kevin Smith, often considered generally nerdy, and you are listening to what is often considered generally nerdy. On Generally Nerdy. Yeah. You're listening to... Generally Nerdy. Generally Nerdy. Generally Nerdy. Okay, so again, first thing out the gate, do I recommend seeing this movie? Yes, with a slight uh, a, a addendum to that. I recommend seeing this movie, it is a lot of fun, but if you're going in expecting something crazy and amazing, you're not gonna get it. This is exactly what you would imagine a real brief history of Han Solo would be. Again, recommendation, sure, go see it. It's a lot of fun, it's very cinemagraphic, uh, the cinematography in this movie is beautiful, um, so we're not really gonna touch on that necessarily, just know that it, it's, it's very, very much like an old western feeling to the cinematography. So, the movie itself, uh, again, plot, we're not going to necessarily go over all of the plot, but we will touch on some things because there's some things that we've talked about in the weekly nerdy videos that we, we're expecting, right? So, we'll touch on those and we'll touch on the disappointing elements of this. First, what did we like? Uh, I honestly liked just generally the feel of this movie was really great. It was a lot of a lot of universe expanding stuff that didn't feel shoehorned. Um, there was a, it, we got to see the empire on an empire controlled world and not on uh, uh, where they're trying to take over or where they have very little power anything like that like we generally have got uh, from Star Wars movies so that was a nice addition other other things that are really cool we got we got to see and this one I go a little bit back and forth on because and I guess we'll get into that on the on the bits that we don't like but I really I really part of me really liked the meeting of Han Solo and Chewbacca because we have Chewbacca set up as this faceless beast, and then when you get to the reveal of, oh, that's Chewie, it's a little comedic. And that's kind of, that's a running theme throughout this movie, is there's there's definitely a funny undertone uh, with a lot of these things, because it's Han freaking Solo, and that's what you're supposed to get with Han Solo. Other things that I really liked is, we get a moment of Han as romantic interest because we get that kind of only it's after he's become jaded in the Holy Trilogy and then we don't really get that at all in the Reboot Trilogy. So it's good to see that fleshed out with a young Han so we can see why he's become so jaded and we can see, and, and there's a little bit more of an explanation there. Again, we'll get into some of the hate that kind of surrounds that in just a second, but that, to me, I felt like that was a great expansion of the character. Uh, other, other great things, I was really interested to see the Kessel Run. Um, I enjoy, I very, very much enjoyed that sequence and towards the end of the movie we actually get to see the Kessel Run. The one qualm I kind of had with that uh, we'll get into again once we get into the, the things we didn't like. Um, the train heist sequence I thought was going to dominate a lot more of the movie. It didn't. It was probably, it was about the first act of the movie was, that was the climax of the first act was the train, train heist. 
I assumed it was going to be the overall climax of the movie because it was billed as a heist movie because we got all the press saying, oh, this is a heist movie in the Star Wars universe. Um, it kind of was and it kind of wasn't. They, there's two heists and the second heist, which takes up Acts 2 and 3, uh, was a lot less a lot less visually appealing and there was a lot less about it that I felt like was as motivating I don't know I just felt like the train heist portion was fantastic but the fuel heist portion what could have been anything and again we'll get to that later but I, I still uh, the train heist was excellently done the introduction of Enfys Nest in the first act is expertly done uh, though there is there is the silly voice uh, masking that she has because she's wearing a, a mask I feel like that they've kind of beat to death but then you get the reveal that it's a, a, a that she's a female in uh, the beginning of act three so it kind of has a different payoff than we've got in previous movies when we get the reveal of who's under the mask I just feel like it's it's yeah sure it's refreshing that it wasn't what some people had expected but the extent to which the voice masking went to I feel like if you didn't expect that reveal you weren't paying attention um, but still I mean I feel like the character was executed well for them to play up the reveal so much seemed a little a little heavy-handed and there's other things that are heavy-handed uh, that we're going to get into in just a moment. But again, overall, the things and the stuff that happened in this movie were definitely worth the, co worth the cost of a mission. So uh, no, no real qualms with that. So moving into some of the hate, which will then transfer us into uh, the things that we didn't like about the movie necessarily. Uh, some, some of the things that people hated about this movie have really nothing to do with this movie. Uh, people calling it Soylo, and that they're ruining Star Wars all based on The Force Awakens, or The Last Jedi, rather. Uh, so a lot of people are hating on this movie who haven't actually seen it. And actually, a lot of the hate that you're going to find if you Google search uh, came out before the movie was even in theaters. So when, even before uh, proper reviewers and things had the ability to see the movie. So don't believe the hype when it comes to the hate on this movie necessarily. And actually, to a certain degree, don't believe the hype about anything that's great about this movie either, because it's it's good. I wouldn't say this is a great Star Wars movie at all. This is if the, the peak of Star Wars is Empire or even Rogue One, then this is rising action. This is building us into something that will have a better payoff eventually. Uh, other things that people are hating on is the mystique. By explaining these things about Han Solo, we we ruin the reveal of who he is in A New Hope. We ruin the reveal of his relationship with Chewbacca and the m mystery that is attached to how they became partners and how Han got into the business and so on and so forth. And I don't... There's a part of me that buys that to a very minor degree, but by and large, I feel like these are the things that make this universe more rich. These are the things that make uh, that make you want to come back and see more. So, more power to them. I feel like this is something, yeah, we didn't ask for this movie, but we didn't ask for Star Wars to begin with, and we didn't ask for Rogue One, and that's one of the best Star Wars movies out there. Uh, easily top three Rogue One is so to make, making the argument of well nobody wanted this movie is really really grasping at straws because we we didn't want we're, we're, we're grateful to have what we get and granted sometimes that is that is The Last Jedi which again I really liked but there's a lot of problems with The Last Jedi. There, I just, I feel like that argument, again, is really, really flimsy. Other things that people are hating on is how Han gets his name, how Han gets his last name, because throughout 
uh, the first portion of the first act, like the ten, first ten minutes or so of the movie, you they're only referring to him by his first name. No one, refer, no one says Solo ever. Uh, he joins the Empire to become a pilot, and because he has no last name, it's kind of a throwaway gag that I'm still kind of on the fence about where the, uh, the Imperial Registry guy says, well, you have no people, then you're by yourself, let's call you Solo, Han Solo. And then that's the name that he keeps throughout the entirety of his life, and when it was given to him by the Empire, I feel like there's a couple of, there's a couple of arguments that you can make for why he would keep it. Uh, the first one being because that gives him, that gives him status. That gives him uh, a place to exist outside of his planet. Outs that gives him a place to exist outside of Corellia because he could be Han of Corellia, he could be, you know, the son of X, Y, and Z, but he didn't, he barely knew his, his father is what he said in the movie, and even though he knew enough about his dad to know that he, he was a pilot, or that he manufactured things rather, and he wanted to be a pilot, he didn't really feel comfortable associating with his father, so when he was given a name, then he, oh yes, I am by myself, and he embraced it. Who cares where it came from? The other argument that I could, that I could make for him keeping that is he didn't care one way or the other when he got the name, he just needed it to get, you know, it was, it was the means to an end. Um, and then once he was in in the thick of it, once he was in the middle of the war or whatever they were doing on that planet three years later, um, trying to flush out all of the hostels, which was a great, which was a great scene. It, the, which was a great couple, few lines of dialogue. Let's let's rephrase that. The scene was forced. The writing, the dialogue in that scene for that second when he's mouthing off to his superior officer is, I feel like, a very great embodiment of that character. So once he got used to the name Solo and he began to, people were calling him that, that he started to embrace it because it, it was the it was the name of a badass. It was the name of this uh, person that he was, for uh, for the most part, uh, to begin with, just creating. He wasn't really this person. He was just trying to portray this person. And as he actually became this person, he owned the name. And again, that's who cares where it came from, so long as it's his ownership of it. Uh, so that's kind of my two cents on the name. Um, and then people are, are upset about uh, the the fact that Corellia was portrayed in the movie as being a, a, a dump when it was never referenced as such in any of the other movies, when it was never referenced as such in any of the extended uh, universe stuff, anything like that. It was always uh, kind of an industrial planet, but they didn't specifically say that it was a dump. It was a... a place that people were trying to get away from when if you I mean really if you think about it if you're describing some place as industrial then we considering our history our social history uh, that isn't exactly appealing uh, industrial has uh, stereotypes of being polluted of being dirty of being cold in a lot of ways so I don't it didn't have to be explicitly said that oh Corellia is a dump calling it an industrial planet calling it the place where they build battleships and 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 things like that star destroyers is kind of saying that without saying that so again it's not really something that you should be getting hung up on then that the 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 last thing before we get into the bits that we didn't like the introduction of the marauders of Emphis Ness and her group of what we perceive in the beginning as marauders and then we learn at the end that they're really fighting for a people uh, there's a couple of things surrounding this first is the introduction uh, there's an argument that I've heard a few times that well if Emphis Ness would have just had the conversation that they have at the beginning of Act 3, if they would have had that conversation with Beckett 
at the beginning of Act 1, then basically the entire uh, train heist wouldn't have happened that way. We would have kept the two characters that died. We we would have... It would have taken... A, a slimmed down the runtime a little bit, because it is a little bit of a long movie we get. It's about... It's over two hours. It's just shy of two and a half hours on runtime. So we could have uh, trimmed that down and we could have had potentially an hour and a half movie, something a little more uh, stereotypical as far as theatrics go. Uh, my argument against that is there was no reason for Emphis Ness to think that these guys were just hired guns and they were actually the good guys. Uh, they, even if she knew they were hired guns, there was still no reason for her to believe that they were the good guys. She doesn't know them from Adam. She doesn't know uh, why they're doing the thing they're doing. All she knows is they're working for the Red Dawn. And we learn that the Red Dawn is horrible and actually led by Darth Maul, which opens up so many possibilities for the future, but we'll get to that at the end. So giving, given the information she has about them, there, it, it, that scene makes sense. There's no reason to to want anything other than that to come from from that opening, uh, the first act where we do get that really awesome train heist, uh, and then the reason they finally do have that conversation is because she has learned a little bit more about them, and and because she saw the way they interacted with the people on that planet that was outside of the Empire's grasp. So, because of that, then she said, oh, maybe these guys aren't the bad guys I assumed they were. And then the other thing, which that leads us directly into that, the other thing is the <clears throat> that they shoehorned the rebellion into this movie. Um, no, they really didn't. The rebellion that Emphis Ness is a part of so let's let's lay out our timeline a little better. This movie takes place somewhere in the neighborhood of five to ten years before A New Hope. So the Empire is really coming into its own as to being a horrible uh, place, as to being this tyrannic regime. As we saw at the midway through the first act, when we're on that planet that... Uh, Solo is on and he's helping the Empire remove the hostiles. Um, hostiles. Well, aren't we the hostiles? I love that line. So keeping, keeping that into consideration, the rebellion isn't quite at its peak yet. And who's to say that there was only one rebellion? But that's all basically irrelevant because the rebellion that Enfys Ness is part of do, they never say explicitly that they're rebelling against the Empire. All they say is that they're rebelling against the Red Dawn. And Red Dawn is a is a is a gang. <laughs> is is mercenaries and and smugglers and things that the Empire would be out to hunt as well. So it's 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 its own entity. So they're rebelling against the control of the Red Dawn because the Red Dawn has control of that section of the galaxy. So to to feel to us to assume just because they use the word rebellion and rebels that they're talking about the rebellion, that they're talking about the uh, you know Leia and the whole nine is to not be paying attention to the dialogue that literally happened 10 seconds earlier. So that kind of that'll lead us into the things we didn't like about Solo. Uh, first thing on the list, the Kessel Run. I said, I know I just said that I liked that sequence, and I did, I really did like that sequence, but the expectation that they set up in the Holy Trilogy was more along the lines of it being some sort of race because and they've retconned this and changed things but if you go back and watch the the holy trilogy if you go back and watch the uh the the, the very first movie a new hope if you go back and watch that it's it's portrayed as a race because he's talking about how the Millennium Falcon is the fastest ship in the universe and it did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Well, 
parsecs to them at the time of the writing was just a, f a funny word that didn't have a meaning to them. It actually did have a meaning, and they found out after the movie came out that a parsec is a unit of distance, not a unit of time. So they've, they've been trying to retcon uh, a lot <laughs> since. So what they did was they made it a run like, a, like, a, like it's like a beer run. Uh, we, somebody's got to run and get it, and they found a shortcut. He found a shortcut through the maelstrom, um, which was an interesting take on it. I just, I, I wanted it to be, I wanted it just like a lot of people have said. I wanted the Kessel Run to be the reason that Han won the Millennium Falcon from Lando, as they kind of implied in uh, the second movie, in, in The Empire Strikes Back. So, I like I said, that one's kind of a 50-50 bit. Another big one for me was L337, uh, which in Leet speak is Leet, which I found kind of funny. But uh, L337, who was voiced by let me let me let me figure this out, Phoebe Waller Bridge. Um, is probably the only thing in this movie that I can see someone making the argument of, oh, it's the SJW Star Wars, because she is kind of the embodiment of what third wave feminism looks like right now. L337, I, I saw an article about how L337 stole the show. She really didn't. She was a nuisance. And the greatest thing she did was die in this movie. So... I don't think that's the one you want to put all your, your I don't think that's the basket you want to pull out, put all your eggs in. Um, she's talking about equal rights and she's talking about all this stuff, which is an issue in Star Wars because a lot of people don't treat droids like uh, intelligent beings, which they are, which is a thing we talk about a lot on the channel. But I just, it was so heavy handed and so out of place. I understand humanizing the droid in order to make that point, but to make your droid so damn annoying was unnecessary. Uh, but, I mean, again, she eventually died and she became a part of the Millennium Falcon. Uh, the other thing I felt like was a little bit of a throwaway was the, uh, the, the escape pod on the Falcon which changed the look of it throughout most of the movie until we get to the maelstrom where we have that Cthulhu thing chasing them through um, the the creature was really awesome that creature was great but just they were doing what they could to add stakes to a scene that really everybody knows has zero stakes because all of the people on that ship, well, not all of the people, but 90% of the people on that ship return in the Holy Trilogy. So we're not going to kill any of them. The ship's not going to go down because Millennium Falcon is a character in and of itself. Uh, so, and that kind of bleeds into the last thing that, that really, really removes you from this movie is the fact that there are very little stakes when it comes to life and death situations if it's a character that exists because of this movie then yeah maybe they'll die but if it be if it's han or chewie or lando they're not gonna die <laughs> so putting them in these death-defying situations becomes pointless because we know they're gonna get out of them Sure, it's interesting to see how they get out of them. Sure, it's interesting to see how they kill the Cthulhu beast. But in the end, it's pointless because we know that it's going to happen. We know they're going to get away from the Cthulhu beast. We don't know they're going to kill the thing, but it, they didn't really kill it. They tricked it into going one way and they went the other and then it kind of killed itself, right? So, I don't know. I just feel like there could have there, there been a better way to do that. Um... And then, kind of one last thing I want to touch on, since we just talked about the droid and Lando, uh, we're going to talk about the thing that Jonathan Caston, the other writer for this movie, because he and his father wrote the movie. Primarily, it was his father writing the movie and then abandoning the script and leaving it to Jonathan and then uh, Disney going, hey, let's make that solo movie. So Jonathan finished the script. Um, 
how much of it was done before Jonathan got his hands on it, we don't know. We probably never will know until Lawrence Castain writes his autobiography. But one thing that Jonathan Castain is taking credit for is the sexuality of Lando. Now, we know little about Lando as far as the movies are concerned. I didn't, I have read quite a few of the extended universe stuff. I haven't read though anything to do with Lando, so I don't know if this was necessarily laid out uh, in any sort of extended universe thing. But a lot of conservative minded types and a lot of like Gamergate minded types are looking at this as another example of SJWs and, and, and sexual identities or X, Y, and Z. And generally speaking, I'm, I'm on board. I'm, I totally agree by and large. Uh, this though, the, the thing that people are taking the biggest issue with is because they identify him as being pansexual. And pansexual, for anybody who doesn't know, is somebody who, the, the way it was explained to me the most eloquently, is somebody who cares about what's between somebody's ears more than they care about what's between their legs. Um, so conservative types have taken that to mean, oh, well, then he could potentially be attracted to kids. That's not how that works. That's, there's... There's so much about that statement that really isn't true. Uh, not Again, not defending the SJW mindset of, of a million different sexualities and a million different genders because there's, there's really nothing behind that. The thing, the thing that I'm trying to convey is that they, were, they did him that way in order to make the, the uh, droid bit more relevant in order to give the droid uh, intelligence more weight because that is an ongoing issue in the Star Wars universe. So to make Lando identified as pansexual, then we get the possibility of a human droid relationship. And if you're worried about the intelligence, again, between the ears more than you are between the legs, that makes sense. That is a thing that shouldn't be that much of an issue. It really is a non-issue. When you watch the movie, uh, Lando never comes out and says, I have feelings for this robot. He just expresses them once she dies, which was a little, that felt a little forced because we have very little, very little interaction between he and the robot um, until she dies. So they could have played that up more and in, in a more reasonable way rather than just hammer fisting it like they did in the two scenes that they had to do it with. Um, but again, it's really a non-issue because it doesn't, it neither detracts nor adds anything to the overall story aside from that side story of the way people treat androids in this universe. So. I, I, I feel like I feel like a lot of the hubbub around this is much ado about nothing. And again, overall, I enjoyed the movie. I think it was much better than basically 90% of the uh, prequel trilogy. Uh, I think it was easily more logically sound than The Last Jedi, though I feel like The Last Jedi was a little bit more... Uh, entertaining as far as action goes which again is not saying a whole lot and it's not that much more entertaining it's not entertaining by much more but uh it, again generally speaking this is at least better than the prequels except for the 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 duel at the end of episode three and that guys is your review for solo a star wars story Thank you guys for watching all the way to the end. Uh, let me know in the comments what you thought about this movie, and let's have the discussion about all of the things that happened. If if you or if or even be a little bit more meta about it, and if you prefer when I do the the plot details and go over it as we go through the the synopsis, then let me know about that too, because I'm still playing with format for this. Though I feel like I like this format a little bit better than the synopsis format. But let me know, guys. Let's talk about it down in the comments section. Thank you nerds for watching all the way to the end. You can check out the links and all the stuff 
Uh, I, sorry, I didn't shoot uh, vlog style this time. Again, that's more along the lines of the format I prefer. Just kind of happened real quick that I got to see the movie. So didn't have time to plan out the vlog. But that's the end of this, guys. Before we go, though, always, always remember, if it's generally nerdy, it's probably here. <laughs>